Okay, let's dive in. What if the real key to slowing down aging wasn't just about managing symptoms, but actually eliminating certain cells? I'm talking about these zombie cells. Right, senescent cells. They just sort of hang around, refusing to die, and frankly, spreading decay and inflammation. It's yeah. a huge target in longevity research now. And that brings us to today's focus, a molecule called procyanidin C1 or PCC1. We're looking at some uh, pretty groundbreaking research here, especially that 2021 paper in Nature Metabolism and also what's happening commercially. Exactly. Our mission today is really to unpack PCC1. We'll get into the science, this really interesting dual action it has, the frankly amazing results they saw in animal studies, particularly muscle and brain health. Yeah. And then, you know, the reality check. How does it go from a lab discovery to something people might actually use? Yeah, the hype versus reality. We want you to have the inside track on this potential new xenotherapeutic. Yeah. All right, so before we get into how it works, what exactly is PCC, like on a chemical level? Sure. So biochemically, it's a natural polyphenol. You find these kinds of compounds in plants all the time. They're protective. But PCC1 is a bit more complex. It's what's called a B-type procyanidin trimer. A trimer, meaning three units stuck together, three epicotetian units, I think. Does that specific structure make a big difference? Why is that trimer set up more powerful than, say, a simpler version? Well, yeah, the complexity seems to be crucial. <laughs> The thinking is that the specific way this trimer folds its shape allows it to interact very precisely with the cellular pathways mm -hmm. that control aging and cell death. You find it naturally in things like grape seeds, um, unripe apples, even some types of cinnamon. And this is one of the really interesting bits from the research, how they pinpointed it. It turns out PCC1 isn't some super rare thing. Not at all. Quite the opposite. It's actually a major active component in standard grapeseed extract, GSE. I mean, think about this. PCC1 makes up something like 6 to 7% of that extract. Wow. Yeah, compare that to other well-known flavonoids like, say, quercetin, which might be less than 1% in the same extract. It's kind of amazing. As scientists looked at grapeseed extract for ages, right? And this super potent anti-aging compound was just sitting there making up a big chunk of it all along. So the 2021 discovery where they screened natural stuff and I did PCC1 for hitting senescent cells, it was less finding something totally new and more like finally recognizing the giant in the room. Okay, and this is where PCC1 really stands out from, well, almost everything else being studied right now. It's got this, you could almost call it an intelligent dual function. Mm -hmm. It changes its job depending on the dose. Right, it fights aging from two different angles. That's the core idea. Exactly. So let's start with the low dose function. You called it the peacemaker role. Mm -hmm. That's the xenomorphic effect. At lower concentrations, PCC1 acts more like a silencer. It doesn't actually kill the senescent cell. Instead, mm -hmm. it basically tells it to shut up. It stops it from spewing out that toxic stuff? Precisely. It suppresses the harmful SASP, that's the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. It's this nasty mix of inflammatory signals like cytokines IL-6 and IL-1, plus enzymes that literally chew up surrounding healthy tissue. Okay, so SASP is like the toxic smoke from the zombie cell factory. That's a good way to put it. By shutting down SASP production, PCC1 dampens that chronic low-level inflammation, what researchers often call inflammaging, which drives so much of the aging process. So low dose keeps the bad neighbors quiet, but then if you increase the dose, it shifts from peacemaker to uh, terminator. Exactly right. That's the synolytic effect. At higher doses, PCC1 selectively triggers apoptosis that's programmed cell death, basically cell suicide, but specifically in the senescent cells. It clears them out. How does it manage that? How does it know to target only the old damaged cells and leave the healthy ones alone? That seems incredibly precise. It targets their survival mechanisms. See, senescent cells stay alive by keeping certain internal pathways, like the BCL2 family of proteins, hyperactive. PCC1 essentially hacks that system. It downregulates the pro-survival signals and ramps up the pro-death signals, like BAX and PUMA. It flips the switch inside the zombie cell itself. Yes. And there's another clever part involving oxidative stress. Ah, right. Tell us about that. So PCC1 actually increases reactive oxygen species, ROS, but specifically inside the senescent cells. These cells already have weaker antioxidant defenses, so this extra push of ROS overwhelms them. It pushes them over the edge. But it doesn't harm the healthy cells nearby. That's the key finding. The research suggests PCC1 actually helps protect healthy cells, potentially by maintaining their levels of antioxidants like glutathione. So only the already stressed vulnerable senescent cells get wiped out by the oxidative hit. It's this dual mechanism, xenomorphic peacekeeper at low doses, xenolytic terminator at high doses that makes it so interesting. 
The theory sounds great, very elegant, but let's be honest, it's the results in animal models that really blew this thing up, right? Talk about the impact on actual lifespan. Absolutely. That's where all the buzz comes from. Okay, so when they gave PCC1 intermittently to mice that were just naturally aging, not some weird fast aging model, just regular old mice, mm -hmm. it extended their total median lifespan by nearly 10%. Which is pretty good on its own. It is. Definitely respectable. But here's the number that really turned heads. They also tested it on very old mice. Think, like... The mouse equivalent of 75 to 90 human years. Okay, starting treatment really late. Really late. And in those mice, PCC1 extended the remaining median survival by 64%. 64%? 64%. Basically a 1.5 times increase in the life they had left. That's, oh. Well, it's almost unprecedented. It suggests it's not just slowing aging down, but potentially reversing some aspects, even when you've started very late in life. That single finding is probably why we're even talking about this today. That's incredible. And it wasn't just about living longer, right? The yeah. sources emphasize it was about extending healthy years, the health span. The treated mice were physically better off. Oh, definitely. The study showed big improvements in physical function. The old mice treated with PCC1 had better endurance on treadmills, much stronger grip strength, better balance, better motor skills compared to the untreated old mice. It seems to directly fight back against sarcopenia, that muscle wasting we see with age. So stronger muscles. What about that systemic inflammation, the inflammaging? Did it tackle that? It did. By shutting down that SASP activity we talked about, markers of system-wide inflammation like IL-6 and MCP-1 dropped significantly. And there was evidence it might even sort of rejuvenate the immune system by clearing out old dysfunctional immune cells, counteracting what they call immunosenescence. And then there's the brain, indications of neuroprotection. Yes, strong indications. It seems to inhibit key inflammatory pathways in the brain, like the NLRP3 inflammasome, which are linked to cognitive decline and neurodegenerative diseases. But getting things into the brain is always tricky, the blood-brain barrier. PCC1 doesn't just waltz across, does it? No, that's a major hurdle. And the researchers knew this. To test it in an Alzheimer's model, they had to get creative. They developed this special delivery system, basically nanoparticles made of albumin and glucose, to act like a Trojan horse, carrying the PCC1 across the barrier to hit the inflammation inside the brain. So it shows the potential, but also highlights the need for smart delivery methods if you want brain benefits. Exactly. Formulation is going to be key for human applications, especially for brain health. And quickly, there were other benefits too. Something about organ scarring and even cancer. Yeah, it showed promise in reducing fibrosis that's scarring in organs like the lungs and kidneys. And kind of a surprising side benefit. In mice, it actually improved the effectiveness of chemotherapy by clearing out senescent cells that the chemo itself creates around the tumor. Turns out those chemo-induced senescent cells can actually help the tumor come back later. So PCC1 was cleaning up the treatment's own damaging side effects, helping the chemo work better long term. Okay, that animal data is undeniably exciting. You can see why there's so much hype. Safe in mice, this cool, dual action, broad, significant results. But let's uh, pump the brakes a little. Moving from mice to humans, that's always the big leap. Where does the science actually stand for people right now? Right, the reality check. And the current status as of now, mid-2025, is pretty clear. There are no published peer-reviewed clinical trials testing PCC1 specifically as an anti-aging therapy in humans. Mm -hmm. All this amazing data is preclinical. So we have to be cautious about extrapolating. Mice aren't tiny humans. Exactly. We have to remember that. But on the plus side, the safety profile in those animal studies looked really good. No major side effects reported at the effective doses. That's true. It seemed very well tolerated. No signs of organ damage or serious toxicity. That's a huge plus for potentially moving forward. The only sort of theoretical risk mentioned is that because senescence plays a temporary useful role in things like wound healing. Oh, okay. If you took a really high senolytic dose right after a major injury, maybe, maybe it could interfere with the initial healing stages. But that's largely speculative at this point. Okay. But while the official science is proceeding cautiously, the commercial side isn't waiting, is it? There's this Chinese startup, Lanvi Biosciences. Yeah, Lanvi Biosciences in Shenzhen. They're already out there selling PCC1-based capsules, marketed as supplements, but pretty high-end ones. We're talking around $250 for what they call a clinic edition pack. And they're specifically trying to copy the science, right? Dosing schedules? They are. Their product info talks about using these three-day pulse schedules, aiming for that high-dose senolytic effect to clear cells, combined with lower daily doses, mm. presumably for this xenomorphic maintenance effect. 
They're trying to replicate that dual action from the research papers. But this brings us back to a critical point, dosing and delivery. Those amazing mouse results, the 64% extension, that was with injections, right? Getting enough PCC1 into the system just by swallowing a pill is tough. It's a known challenge for polyphenols generally. Your gut and liver can break them down pretty effectively before much gets into your bloodstream. So for an oral product to work like the injections did in mice, it would likely need to be incredibly concentrated or use some advanced formulation technology, maybe something like those albumin glucose nanoparticles or another delivery system to improve absorption. So just taking standard grapeseed extract pills isn't going to cut it if you're aiming for that high-dose senolytic effect. Almost certainly not. The concentrations needed are likely way beyond what you'd get from typical GSC supplements. Okay, so how does PCC1 stack up against other big names in the longevity space? We hear about metformin, rapamycin. Right, it's important to see where it fits. PCC1 is primarily positioned as a senolytic, a zombie cell killer. That makes it different from, say, rapamycin, which targets the MTOR pathway, kind of mimicking caloric restriction, and different from metformin, which mainly works on metabolic health through AMPK activation. They target different pillars of aging. And compared to other senolytics, like that D plus Q combo. Yeah, PCC1 is often talked about as a potential second generation senolytic. The first generation often refers to things like the combination of disatinib, which is actually a cancer drug, plus quercin, D plus Q. D plus Q can be effective, but disatinib comes with a known list of potential side effects, you know, like low platelet counts. Right, which makes it less appealing for healthy people to take long term just for prevention. Exactly. The hope for PCC1 being a natural compound is that it might offer similar senolytic benefits, but with a much milder safety profile, making it more suitable for broader preventative use. So the future might be about combining these different approaches. That seems to be where the field is heading. You can imagine combination strategies, maybe use PCC1 intermittently, like a pulse therapy, to clear out senescent cells, and then use something like metformin daily for metabolic maintenance, or maybe combine it with NAD plus boosters for energy pathways, stacking therapies that hit different root causes of aging simultaneously. So wrapping this up, what's the main takeaway for someone listening? PCC1 looks like a really potent natural compound targeting cellular senescence head on. And in animals, at least, it shows these incredibly broad benefits, better mobility, better immunity, less inflammation. Yeah, the scientific potential is huge, undeniable. We're watching this rapid shift from lab finding to commercial product almost in real time. Hmm. And you see companies like Lonvi Biosciences making these, frankly, very bold claims about PCC1 helping people live to 120, even 150. Which leads to a pretty big final thought, doesn't it? These cutting-edge anti-aging interventions, starting with things like Lonvi's $250 supplements. They're expensive, initially at least. Very expensive. So as the human trials hopefully get underway and we learn more, it raises this critical question. Are Cena therapeutics like PCC1 going to become standard preventative medicine for everyone, a way to extend healthy life across the board? Or are we looking at the start of a longevity divide? Where a significantly extended health span, maybe even lifespan, becomes a luxury good, primarily accessible only to the wealthy. Yeah. That's a massive ethical and societal question hanging over this entire field. Definitely something to keep a close eye on as the science continues to race forward.